Welcome, welcome, welcome. I sure appreciate you joining us today. The True Word Faith for Life uh, YouTube channel and podcast through um, Buzzsprout and everywhere that you listen to audio only. I call it Face for Radio. Uh, podcasts. I'm glad you're joining us today. Anybody joining us live, thank you very much. If you could, if you're in the chat, please let me know. Uh, is it too loud, too quiet, buzzy, whatever? I sure would appreciate it. And uh, we're looking good here. So today, love, the power of faith versus the pain of loneliness. I've counseled thousands of people over the course of my counseling time, and I I counsel tier one operators and and uh, war fighters, and I counsel uh, gold star families and and other people who who uh, need help. Not to say that I know everything, but I've I've got a background in counseling and some degrees and whatnot, and I've been privileged to help some people. And one of the things, one of the biggest things, one of the biggest things I think I've ever noticed is how hard. How hard it is to get through life without love. How hard it is to get through life without love. And and the pain of loneliness. Look, faith has this immense power. Just this immense power. It's extraordinary. It's extraordinary. The pain of loneliness. The constant battle. Thank you, Kim. Kim's one of my classmates from uh, Cape and Lopen High School in Lewis, Delaware. You all would pronounce that Lewis, but it's Lewis. First town in the first state? 302 area code. One area code, whole state. Three counties. That's it. Sussex, Kent, and Newcastle. So... We're going to talk about that very powerful topic, but I want to share something free of charge, no cost or obligation to you, that I think is critically important if we're going to talk about love, especially with the mass devastation in Florida, Georgia, and Western North Carolina. I want to define charity for you. What is charity? Charity, we use that word all the time, but do we really know what it means? Charity in the Christian faith is far more than simply giving to those in need. It's the highest form of love. It's the highest form of love that reflects God's own love for humanity, for you. It's the selfless, sacrificial, unconditional love that extends kindness, mercy, and compassion to others without expecting anything in return. As described in 1 Corinthians 13, charity is patient, kind, not envious, boastful, or proud. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. It is the love that binds us together, the love that serves others, and the love that reflects the very heart of God. This perfect God-inspired charity is the foundation of our faith, the force that drives us to love others deeply, just as God has loved us. Secondly, and also free of charge at no cost or obligation to you, a quick Hebrew uh, and Aramaic lesson. I want to explain the meaning of two words I say often, shalom alechem, or if, if it's in um, Aramaic, Shalom Alechum. It's a Hebrew greeting that means peace be upon you. Let peace be all over you. Let the absence of chaos flood you. It's often used in Jewish communities as a traditional greeting or a, a blessing. It's a beautiful thing. The response to Shalom Alechem is Alechem Shalom, which means upon you be peace. This greeting is similar. If you've heard Muslims in the Arabic, um, the greeting is similar to, uh, in spirit, to Assalamu Alaikum, which has the same meaning. So, Shalom, my friends, and welcome back to the True Word Faith for Life with Dr. Sean. I'm Dr. Sean, and today we're diving into one of the most profound truths of our faith, the power of love and the devastating sadness 
of loneliness. Our Creator, the God of Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, fashioned us with one central need. To give and to receive love. Good morning, Martin. I love you, brother. I'm to see. Buenos dias. This need is not a weakness. This need for love is not a weakness. It's, a, it's the core of who we are. And when we are what we were described to be, what we were designed to be, what we were engineered to be, people who love, to give and to receive love, we're reflecting God Himself. Today we're going to explore this foundational truth. We're going to look at the most powerful force of our faith, love, and the greatest sadness the enemy tries to impose upon us, loneliness. Now, I want to share with you something first as a reminder of why it's so important to interpret and translate Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, the languages and cultures of Scripture, why it's so important for us to interpret it accurately and within context. And we're talking about love, and I thought it'd be, I thought it'd be a good extra thing at no cost or obligation to you. Have you ever heard the phrase, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated? That comes from Malachi um, 2, it comes from Malachi 1, verse 2 and 3, and it is quoted in Romans 9, 13. It goes like this, I loved you, says Adonai, but you ask, how did you show us your love? Esau was Yaakov's brother, Esau, and... and um, so you remember this story. Adonai answers, Yet I loved Yaakov, but I hated Esau, or Esau. Jacob, I loved Jacob, but I hated Esau. You've heard this. In Sunday school, you've heard this. In pulpits all across the country, you've heard this. Now, don't go make fun of your preacher just because you're going to learn something new now. Don't go run into your preacher and say, Hey, you were wrong all this time. No. You know, I had to go through a lot of schooling to get to this point. And it was and it was a lucky thing that was taught to me by one of my one of my instructors, one of my professors, Dr. Eli Lazorkin, um, over in Israel right now in Tel Aviv. God bless those people. Pray for the Israeli people. Pray for them because uh, Iran has said, you know, we're going to annihilate you, and now they say they're going to make good on it. There's an imminent. Our intelligence tells us there's an imminent attack coming. God bless those people as if they have one more thing they need. They don't need. So yet I loved Yaakov, but I hated Esau. And I made his mountains desolate and gave his territory to desert jackals. Now, in this passage, you've been taught, I'm sure, that hated means hated and love means love. He loved the one son. One son was good. The other son, Esau, not so good. Jacob, I love. He's easy to love. Jacob, who couldn't love Jacob? But Esau, mm, he's a tough one. So I hated him. So we think, oh, okay. Yeah, so there is hate. Yeah, okay. Got it. Got it. Wrong. It's not true. I believed it too. I grew up my whole life being taught that. When I went into seminary, parts of seminary, I was taught that. And then all of a sudden, I was taught by, you know, one of the greatest in the world, uh, Skip Moen, Dr. Arthur J. or Skip Moen, he prefers just to be called Skip, an amazing, amazing uh, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek teacher, and Dr. Eli Lazorkin, amazing. I've thought this my whole life. I thought this was the meaning my whole life. Honestly, I did. And maybe you did too. So don't throw rocks at your pastor or your Sunday school teacher. So in this passage, God's expressing his love for Israel. He's expressing his love for Israel, Jacob's descendants, Yaakov's descendants, by contrasting it with his rejection of Esau, Esau, Edom's. Descendants. The term here, hated, 
In Hebrew is sonne, sonne. Here, as mentioned earlier, emphasizes God's choice and preference for Jacob or Yaakov uh, for his lineage over Esau or Esau's lineage, signifying a rejection of Esau in the terms of a covenantal blessing and purpose. It highlights the special relationship God has with Israel and his faithfulness to his promises to Yaakov or Jacob. In Hebrew, sane, uh, hate, doesn't always mean hate in the way we understand it today. Here's the lesson. Uh, we understand it today as an intense dislike or hostility. Instead, what it actually means is to love something less, to reject something, or to regard that something with less favor. And in the context of Malachi, or Malachi, Hated implies that God chose Jacob and his descendants, Israel, for a special covenantal relationship and purpose, while Esau or Esau and his descendants, Edom, were not chosen for this role. So this reflects God's sovereign choice and preference rather than a feeling of animosity or personal hatred. Therefore, in that passage, hated, if we're to understand love, we have to understand hate. It's the push and the pull. It's the yin and the yang. It's the love and the hate. Hated in this passage means that Esau or Esau was not selected or preferred in the way that Jacob was or Yaakov. It emphasizes the contrast in God's purpose and plan for the respective descendants. See, this is... This is exactly why we have to look deeper and understand that in order to have a deeper understanding of God's intent for us in His Word, in His Scripture, in the Holy Bible, we have to dig deeper in the languages, bit by little, little bit, little by little, by, but you don't have to eat an elephant all. Don't eat an elephant. Don't eat an elephant when I say don't. You can't eat an elephant all in one bite. Don't eat an elephant. I like elephants. They're one of my favorite animals. Don't eat them. But if you were going to eat them, if you were hungry and haven't eaten, by all means. That was free of charge at no cost or obligation to you. So, I want you to remember to pray. Remember my last uh, broadcast? You can, you can look. I think it's linked here. Um, please pray for those that, that are in western North Carolina. It is utterly devastating. Be, it's, it's beyond anything you've ever seen. I've never seen it. I've been in some bad places and some bad situations, but I've never seen that. So, you have to dig deeper. You have to dig deeper in your prayer. Remember, if you click on that link in the description, it'll like, it, just feel free to watch that. That's also free. Everything here is free. And if you're listening on the audio-only Face for uh, Radio podcast, the True Word Faith for Life podcast, if you're listening uh, to this one, it's not live. Uh, if you could just, you know, if you haven't heard that episode, please click on that link. Uh, and if you haven't uh, subscribed for whatever reason, and but you but you like what you know what this is, and you like the mission here, then please. If you could only know how important it is just to click on subscribe, it doesn't cost you anything. I don't spam anybody. I don't, I don't get all your information. I don't do any of that stuff. Number one, I don't know how. But the bottom line is, is if you would, that would be massive for me. It's a free thing you can do for me and actually for other people because the more subscribers, the more likes, the more shares, the more people see this that need it. So let's get started. Let's get started. Put that, put that in your prayer, by the way. Remember I talked about a prayer book or, or even, on your, even on your phone? Put, put in there. Put in there. Prayer list. Make a prayer list. Or if you're a person who writes, put it in your daily journal and move it to the next day and move it to the next day. I don't want to preach that whole sermon again, but, but then you just you stay up to date with it. Every week you follow up. Every couple of days you follow up. Maybe every week you follow up with them. Hey, real quick, I just wanted to check, check in with you. I wanted to see how things were going. You know, I've been praying about this. How's this going? Is there anything else I can do? And if the thing has been resolved, you pray right there with them and thank God. Thank God. A simple, quick prayer. Thank God 
Thank you, Father, for for working in this. Thank you, Father, for working this out. And if maybe it didn't turn out so good as we hoped, then continue to pray. Say, Father, we trust your sovereignty. We trust your perfect will. We don't see around corners like you do, but we're trusting you and we're going to honor you just like Job, just like so many. I also want to say real quick, a quick shout out to Daniil uh, Norwood and uh, she used to be Daniil Schnitzius and we went to high school together and their, their uh, business, Sea Hag Marina in Steenhatchee, Florida was direct hit, uh, 20 feet of water. 20 feet of water, a storm surge, winds of 125 miles per hour, utter devastation. They lost their home. They lost you know, their business. Almost every business in Steenhatchee is destroyed. Almost every one. Uh, the mail, the, the uh, post office, gone. Can't get their mail. The, um, the roads are still blocked. The uh, school, you know, extremely damaged. Um, their pharmacy gone. Their grocery store, their little tiny grocery store, gone. So you have to understand, it's, it's, it's utter devastation. They're working so hard. Pray that they'll be protected from injury, that they won't get bit by snakes. So that, you know, these snakes get washed up and underneath all the rubble, and they start pulling and pulling and pulling, and all of a sudden, wham. And uh, so just pray for them. Pray for their safety. Pray that God will comfort their hearts. Give them rest. And um, and heal them for the folks in Georgia, and the folks in in uh, Western North Carolina. My goodness, pray for them. Don't just say it. Remember what I said in the podcast. Um, the link is in the description. Click on that and watch it after we're finished here. And if you subscribe, you get notifications of all that stuff, and all of that's available to you for free anytime. So I want to start with this. God's perfect love for us, the pinnacle of love. Perfect. God's perfect love for us. Perfect is perfect. Perfect is without error, without flaw. Uh, All of you listening, even if it's three people or three million people, all of you listening, you know what imperfect conditional love is. Is because that's what you've experienced in your life. Many of you have have never experienced perfect love. Some of you have never experienced the perfect love of Yeshua Hamashiach, Jesus Christ, Jesus the Messiah. You've never invited him into your heart. And I want to invite you to do that, to ask him into your heart to forgive you of your sins, to help heal your hurts, habits, and hang-ups, and to help you live a life for him. Not not for the people in the church, not to get their approval, but for a relationship with God through the Holy Spirit. So the God's perfect love for us, the pinnacle of love, the very best, the very top. So let's begin with an undeniable truth. God is Love. His love isn't, it, you know, emotion. One of the things I tell people in my practice is, look, you can't, love is not an emotion. It's not an emotion. My uh, dear friend and uh, Pastor Russell Wright, I love him. I love his family, Missy and Rob, and, and his whole, you know, I love them. And his mama uh, or his wife, Dr. or um, Pastor Russ's wife, Kathy, Miss Kathy, love, love, love. And this past Sunday, we were honored to be in their church. Missed you, Miss Sharon. Um, I was hoping to surprise you, but we'll see you again. We'll be back there again. But in the um, Virginia Creek Campgrounds Church, um, Pastor spoke about love. And then we got to see a little surprise. People we didn't even know. We were crying over people we didn't know. There was a surprise renewal of vows right then and there. They had cake. They had flowers. Um, It was lovely. It was so cool. And we got to experience that. But you know what? Love is is not an emotion. You know what? Those people have been married 20-some years. And over those 20-some years, you haven't felt the emotion of love for each other. Anybody that's been married a long time or been in a relationship a long time, you know that emotion is not love and love is not a fleeting emotion or a mere concept. It's God's very essence. It's the essence of God. The Apostle Yochanan, or John, Hebrew, Yochanan, English, John, 
Not the same name, but that's what we gave it. He writes in 1 John 4.16, We ourselves have come to know and put our trust in the love God has for us. God is love. God is love. And those who remain in His love remain united with God, and God remains united with them. From the very beginning, God's love was manifested when He breathed the life into humanity, creating us in His own image. He loved us so much, He created us in His own image. I'm going to do a sermon on what that means in Hebrew and Aramaic. Creating us in His own image. What that means. We are called nephesh. I say this a lot. Try to teach a little bit here and there. Nephesh, God's word for humanity, is nephesh. And what that literally means is the being that prays. We're the being that prays. We're the being that cares enough about something outside of us to pray. I wonder how much we pray, God, help me to love you more. Help me to love you better. God, help me to not be mired in my own emotions and the struggles of life. Yes, I need your help for the, I need your help with those things, but I just pray that you would, you would help protect me from becoming mired in the terrible, tough things of life and that I would be in deep, close relationship, a love relationship with you. We are Nefesh, the being that prays. This love reached its zenith in Yeshua the Messiah, Yeshua Hamashiach. Romans, that's Jesus Christ the Messiah, Romans 5.8, reminds us, but God demonstrates his own love for us in that the Messiah died on our behalf. We so quickly go through that because in Sunday school, that's how we said them, especially if we memorized them. It was, but God demonstrates his own love for us and that the Messiah died on our behalf while we were still sinners. We go so fast through that, slow it down. Slow it down. But God reminds us to slow it down. God demonstrates his own love for us in that the Messiah died on our behalf. And we are sinners. We were sinners then. We are sinners now. And we will be sinners until he comes again. And calls us unto him for those who have called upon his name and placed their faith in him. He died for us, and we're sinners. He died on our behalf, and we're sinners. Imagine that. While we were and are unworthy, undeserving, God gave the ultimate sacrifice, his son. He was tortured horrifically, and he was murdered. Horrifically. And he did that to demonstrate the depths of his love for us. And you know what? That'd be a great story. It'd be a powerful story. We would we would be so moved by that story if it ended there. But I'll tell you now, the cross is empty. There is dust, crimson dust, underneath that cross, the very blood of Jesus Christ. And and he was placed into a borrowed grave. Joseph of Arimathea lent him, he was a very wealthy man, lent him his grave. And he was put in there. Oh my goodness. He was put in there. And for three days, he was separated from God. But on the third day, He rose again, just as was prophesied. And he's coming back for those who call upon his name. Listen, this is the love that pursued Adam and Chava. Now, I want to say Chava is Eve's real name. Eve, I'll explain. Um, Another free lesson. I forgot to add this to the free lessons. This is another free lesson, free of charge, no cost or obligation to you. I don't want a toaster for this. This is Eve's real name, Chava. Adam, or man, the man, Chava, 
Eve's real name, when they hid in shame. This is the love that pursued Adam and Chava, or Adam and Eve, when they hid and they sinned. And they hid in shame, and yet he pursued them. This is the love that carried B'nai Israel, which means, in Hebrew, the children of Israel through the wilderness, despite their constant rebellion. They made an 11-day trip into a 40-year journey. Come on! We do it too. We make our lives harder than they need to be. This is the love that calls out to us today, even in our brokenness, even in our desperation, even in our dire circumstances, and says, you are mine. You, you are mine, beloved. And I love you. The power of our love for each other. Listen, folks. This is point number two, the power of our love for each other. If you're taking notes, please don't do that if you're driving or you're flying a commercial aircraft, um, you know, I don't know, flying Falcon 9, you're up in the space. Well, if you're up in the space station, click on like. You can click on subscribe. You don't have that much to do. You're up in space. What do you want? Yeshua gave us a mandate that captures the heart of God's intention for humanity, for nefesh, the beings that pray in in Yochanan or John 13, 34 through 35, he said, I am giving you a new command that you keep on loving each other, that you keep on loving each other. Folks, they loved each other. And he said, I'm giving you a new command that you keep on loving each other. You keep on loving each other. In the tough times, in the hard times, in the, in the confusing times, keep on loving each other. In the same way that I have loved you, you are also to keep on loving each other. Everyone will know that you are my Talmudim, which is disciples, by the fact. Come on. Underline this. Highlight this in your Bible. By the fact... They will know that you are my disciples, my Talmudim, by the fact that you have love for each other. Oh, come on. They're going to know we're followers of the way by how we love each other. But you know what? We don't do that. We're stubborn. We're hard, hard, hard minded people. We are stubborn. And we say, I'm not going to love that person anymore. And they're in church. We get in tiffs with people in church for the stupidest of reasons and sometimes for good reason. But you know what? We have to love one another. We have to resolve our issues. We can't carry grudges. God commands us. He commands us. I'm giving you a new command to keep on loving each other in the same way that I have loved you. I gave you an example. For all that time we were walking together, I loved you. I showed you what love is. So now you are to keep on loving each other because at first they didn't love each other. Even the ones that were brothers didn't love each other. And if you do this, if you love one another, as I have loved you, everybody will know that you are my Talmudim, my disciples, by the fact that you have love for each other. Listen, the power of our faith is most evident in how we love one another. When we extend kindness, when we extend kindness and patience, forgiveness and understanding, and that is not easy. Look, God is not saying this in Scripture, saying, listen, I'm going to suggest this to you. I'm going to suggest this. This is a suggestion if you want to do it, if you think you can. If it feels good, if the emotion is there. But if not, you don't have to. No, it's a command. It's a command to all of us. It's a command to me, and it's a command to you. And I'm not the easiest to love all of the time. Look, but when we do this, we become living testimonies, living examples of God's love. This love is not just words or feelings. It's action. It's sacrifice. It's commitment. It's the parent who tirelessly cares for a sick child. It's the friend who listens without judgment. It's the spouse who forgives and the community that embraces the outcast, the community which has lost everything, everyone, 
all who have lost everything, and they are still trying to help their neighbor in any way they can. People with nothing left, nothing, nothing left, but their lives and their love, and they are helping others who also lost everything but their lives. This kind of love is transformative. It heals wounds. It restores relationships. It builds bridges where walls once stood. Proverbs 10, 12 goes this way. Hate stirs up disputes, but love... If you're writing it down, it's Proverbs 10, 12. Hate stirs up disputes, but love covers all kinds of transgressions. When we love with a capital L, we reflect God's heart and His kingdom here on earth. This is why love is the most powerful force in our faith. It changes lives. And it reflects the nature of the Almighty. And I'll submit to you, that's why it changes lives. If you're writing it down, if you're keeping notes, if you've got your pen all ready to rock and roll on your piece of paper, or you're typing it out on your phone or your tablet or your computer, here you go. Loneliness. This is number three. Loneliness. It's the devil's tool to separate us. It's the devil's tool to separate us. Loneliness. I always say, listen, fentanyl is a dangerous, terrible drug. Absolutely. So is heroin. Some of you have been touched by all these drugs. So is crack. So so is crystal meth. So 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 are all of them. So are opioids. So are all of them. But I'm telling you, the most dangerous substance known to man is loneliness. And some of you are there now. You are so lonely. Listen, I had somebody say to me the other other day, they said, Brother, pray for me. Uh, I have become a victim of a romance scam and scammed out of all of his money. He's a good buddy. He's a good, good dude, served honorably, service-connected, disabled, totally disabled. And someone took, an organization took terrible advantage of him, just like they do. I'm a fan of the death penalty for people that do things like this, but took all of his money, took his dignity. And he said, I'm embarrassed to say this, but I was lonely. This is why I fell prey to this. I knew better, but I was lonely. Listen, that's a darkness that seeks to undermine God's love. This is the devil's weapon of choice, loneliness. Loneliness is not just being alone. It's it's the crushing belief. It's the voice in your ear that whispers, no one cares. No one sees you. Hey, you are completely alone. You are completely isolated. And nobody cares if you live or die. I'm telling you, the devil is a liar. The devil is a liar. It's a dangerous lie that whispers, you are unlovable, you are unworthy, and you are forgotten. And let me tell you something, friends, all around, wherever you're listening in this internet sanctuary, I'm telling you now, I have heard those words whispered in my ear. You are unlovable, you are unworthy, and you are forgotten. I've heard these words, and I've been lonely like you cannot imagine. I've experienced loneliness in the midst of a crowd. I'm the youngest of five, but I was terribly, terribly lonely. Even in a big family, terribly lonely. Look, the devil uses loneliness to create division, distrust, and despair. It's his way of pulling us away from the love of God and the love of others. This loneliness can manifest even in a crowd Even in a marriage, even in a marriage, even in a family, no matter how small, no matter how large, the devil, this loneliness can come even in the midst of a crowd. I remember a feeling when I was standing before 21,000 people preaching in one of the largest churches in this country, and I remember feeling lonely. I'm thinking to myself, why are you lonely? These people just gave you a standing ovation. Why are you lonely? He 
even in a crowd, even in your marriage, even in a family, even within, sadly, the walls of a friendly church. Even within the walls of a friendly church. Listen, I, wanna, I want you to write on your prayer list a dear brother of mine. His name is Scott Brodeen. Scott Brodeen. He's in Minnesota. And he's a dear brother, and he's, he's running for office. And I pray that he will win. He's a great guy. He's got his head screwed on right. He loves Jesus. He loves his family. He loves his community. He'd be phenomenal. November 5th, pray for him. Pray for him. Even in a friendly church. Wait a second, what? I, you, you're telling me I can feel lonely even in a friendly church. Even, in, even within the walls of a friendly church, I can feel lonely? Many of you can answer that question, yes. Yes, you can. You sure enough can. But the truth is, God's love is always present. His love is always present. It's always real. It's not imagined. It's always real. And it is always always the perfect love. Psalm 139, 7 through 10. Where can I go to escape your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I climb up to heaven, you are there. If I lie down in Sheol, you are there. If I fly away with the wings of the dawn and land beyond the sea, even there your hand would lead me. Your right hand would hold me fast. Even in the depths of loneliness, God's love reaches us. We are never truly alone. Number four, if you're taking notes, our call to combat loneliness with love. My brothers and sisters, we have a mandate to combat the tool of loneliness with the power of love. Each of us carries within us the light of Messiah. And we're called to shine that light into the darkest corners of this world. When we reach out to the lonely, when we reach out to the brokenhearted, when we reach out to the widow and the orphan and the stranger, we are embodying the love of Yeshua. Isaiah 58.10 reminds us, If you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then your light will rise in the darkness and your gloom will become like noon. Folks, Franklin Graham and, and the Graham family that are involved with Samaritan's Purse and all the many, many volunteers, I am telling you it's one of the greatest organizations known to man, led by a humble, humble man, the son of Dr. Billy Graham. And they're already in the places most devastated. I'll also have you know, you may not be aware, but their own homes were impacted. Their own towns, Boone, North Carolina, where they live and where they're from, devastation. And yet those trucks rolled. And yet those people are setting up hospitals, triage centers, food centers, cleansing centers where you can go in and get a hot shower. And you can use the restroom clean. You can get your wounds attended to. And you can be fed. You can be ministered to in the name of Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, I don't want to go behind Billy Graham and Franklin Graham in heaven. I do not want to be standing in line behind those folks because I'm telling you the crowns the crowns are going to be piled high as the heavens. What an example. If you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then your light will rise and the darkness and your gloom will become like noon. Folks, there is no better way, I'm telling you, there's no better way to escape your loneliness than to reach out others reach out listen if you it, you, you you maybe maybe your life is tough but i'm telling you it's sometimes the greatest light comes when you reach through that and you tell the devil you're a liar 
and you reach through that and you reach out to others and you reach out to the hungry and you satisfy the needs of the afflicted to the best that you can. Your light will rise in the darkness and your gloom will become like noon. Loneliness can be devastating, but it has no place in the kingdom of God. Every time we take a moment to listen, to encourage, to lend a hand, or to simply be present, we are pushing back against the darkness. We are declaring that God's love reigns supreme and that no one is beyond His reach. I want to close with this. Love, the greatest commandment. Let us never forget that love is the most powerful force of our faith. As Yeshua said in Matthew 22, Metityahu, which is in Matthew 22, 37 through 39. You are to love Adonai, your God, with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. This is the greatest and most important mitzvah. And a second is similar to it. You are to love your neighbors as yourself. And you know what? I'm so lucky. I'm so lucky. It's easy to love my neighbors. My neighbors are awesome. My neighbors are awesome, but you know what? I used to live. I used to live next door to somebody who wasn't so awesome. And they were tough to love. Mm hmm. Yeah. Very tough. We would have church, KLA, over to our over to our little place and um, in Delaware. And you know what? And that we would only do that when I was too sick to travel. So they would come to us, and people would be respectful. They park right, and we lived in a cul-de-sac. And it was every other neighbor didn't have any problem with it. But boy, she would call the police every time she called the police. She would call the police. She knew what we were doing. I'd send a message out there. Hey, buddy, listen, there's going to be a little bit of a, for about an hour and a half, there's going to be a little, but if you need anything, you come knock on our door and someone will come move a car if you need to. We didn't block anybody in. Not at all. People could still turn around. People could do what they needed to do, but she called the police every time. You were to love your neighbor as yourself. Let me tell you something. That is the hardest thing. Love God. Love people. Love God. Love people. This is our calling. This is our power to love God. To love God and to love people. This is our power. This is our calling. And to those who feel the weight of loneliness today, listen, I want you to know this. You are seen. You are loved. And you are not alone. God's love is pursuing you right now. Let us be a community that reflects His love so that, it, that loneliness has no place to hide among us. Let's go forth with renewed hearts. Let's go forth ready to love fiercely and to break the chains of loneliness and to show the world the life-changing power of God's love. Amen and amen. Shalom alaikum. Thank mm-hmm. you.